Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back in Boston. The last time I was here for a book event was, I think, in 2004 when my book Six Questions of Socrates came out. Um, I started in 1996 philosophical dialogue groups called Socrates Cafe, uh, hoping to revive a form of inquiry that had been made famous by the Greek philosopher of old. And with this idea that the hallmark of a vibrant democracy is that citizens willingly consider a wide range of objections and alternatives to their own way of seeing things. And Socrates Cafe was meant to be a, friend, a space for friends and foes, intimates and strangers alike, to gather together and explore thoughtfully and reasonably timely and timeless existential problems, an exploration that ideally makes people feel bound together more. Um, but that was Socrates Cafe, and this is Constitution Cafe, kind of a follow-on in a very imaginative way. But let me just ask you a question first. What word does the People's Republic of China ban in its blogs and chat rooms, but uses many, many times in its own constitution? Democracy. How can that be? They're, they're a democratic republic, they claim. And yet they won't allow that word to be used in its blogs and chat rooms. How can that be? Off with their heads. Um, however, let me ask you another question. What word is not in the U.S. Constitution that you think might be there? I mean, it's the beacon of the free world, after all. What, what word is lacking that you might think? Yes? Democracy. Democracy. It's not in that 4,543-word document. Many scholars even mistake this and call the United States a constitutional democracy when, in fact, it is a? Republic. Not just a republic, but a constitutional republic. So what is that? Constitutional republic is a state country in which the head of the state and other officials are representatives of the people and must govern according to ex existing constitutional laws that at least theoretically limit the government's power over all of its citizens. The fact that a constitution exists that limits the government's power makes the country constitutional. Democracy on the other hand is a form of government in which all people have an equal say in the decisions that affect their lives. Well, what document do you think affects the decisions that they can make in their lives more than the Constitution? Um, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a little bit. The framers of our Constitution were radicals, if, at least in this one sense. They wouldn't settle for simply reforming our original governing document the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. They decided that no amount of revising the Articles would salvage them, and so the United States needed to be constituted anew, not merely with greater power, but also in a way that resolved the underlying uncertainties that they believed had been gen generated by the Articles of Confederation. So the two principal boosters for a new constitutional convention were actually very unlikely bedfellows. James Madison, and I know some of you people know the other one. Who else? Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton at the time an assemblyman in New York. Um, they believed um, that, that it was time to just totally revise the Articles. However, the Articles of Confederation, our original Constitution, had this very hard and fast stipulation that any changes made to it had to be agreed to by all the 13 state legislatures. But guess what? When the Constitutional Convention was convened, only 12 states showed up. Rhode Island, like Patrick Henry of Virginia, smelled a rat. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. So from the very beginning, when a majority of the 55 delegates from just 12 states determined that the Articles could not be saved and made the decision to supplant them with an entirely new Constitution, the argument can be made that they had no sanction to do so. It was an illegal act from the very beginning. Couldn't do it. They did it anyway, but they couldn't do it. Now, Thomas Jefferson learned of their plan from his post as U.S. Minister in France. 
Did anybody, a lot of people think that Thomas Jefferson was there, but he wasn't. He was across the water in France. Um, and he claimed to like much, in principle, the general idea of framing a government which should go on in itself peaceably without needing, as the Articles did, continual recurrence to the state legislatures. With the Articles, all the state legislatures had to agree on just about anything, uh, whether it was coming to a treaty or taxes or anything. They all had to agree, and it was just a mess, granted. Um, but even so, that's what they agreed to have. Um, they wanted a highly decentralized government after what they had to encounter with the monarchy. Um, even if those taking part had been authorized to carry out the creation of a new constitution, you could make the case that for worse or for better, they weren't representative of most Americans. The typical delegate to the Constitutional Convention was a privileged member of the upper class or what was still a hierarchical society and didn't represent directly in any reasonable way American society as a whole. Rather, the 55 framers represented faithfully the white, adult, male, affluent, or near-affluent segment of the population. But you might ask, couldn't the same thing be said of the founders, of the founding fathers? After all, those 56 patriots who signed the Declaration of Independence were also unrepresentative of Americans as a whole. One telling difference was that they signed a galvanizing and unifying document, befitting of Thomas Jefferson's character characterization of it as an expression of the American mind that set the colonists free. The Constitution, on the other hand, arguably was meant by those who crafted it to rein them in a good bit. Only eight of our Declaration signers also attended the Constitutional Convention and served as framers for the Constitution. But even with the absence of the likes of Thomas Jefferson and most other founding fathers, there were still some very exceptional men of talent and public virtue. For instance, James Madison, who's considered the father of the Constitution, he might not have been a signer of the Declaration, but he still was one of our greatest political scientists, according to most uh, political theorists today. Yet even the incomparable Madison couldn't foresee the future of the American Republic, nor could he draw on knowledge that might be gained from later experiences with democracy in America and elsewhere. I mean, while the knowledge of Madison and his fellow framers may well have been the best knowledge available in 1787, the fact was that reliable knowledge about constitutions appropriate to representative, a large representative republic was at best meager. And so they were limited by, so to speak, their inevitable in ignorance. Nonetheless, the framers of the Constitution felt certain that the high value they placed on republicanism was overwhelmingly shared by citizens of all states. There's one hitch to that, though. The framers never asked their fellow Americans what they wanted, and so they never gave them a chance to weigh in on what specific type of republican system they preferred. Rather, with Madison steering the proceedings, the delegates agreed to keep their discussions private supposedly so they could speak freely. As a consequence, there's no public record of the proceedings of the Constitutional Convention. Thomas Jefferson, for one, was dismayed by this news, and he wrote to John Adams, I am sorry that the Convention began their de deliberations by so abominable a precedent as that of tying up the tongues of its members. In Jefferson's estimation, nothing can justify this example but the ignorance of the value of public discussion. Nonetheless, on September 17, 1787, the new Constitution was approved, but only by 39 of the 55 delegates. So, we can argue about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing or not uh, ad nauseum, right? But the two years, more than 200 years after the fact, the very prominent political scientist from Yale, Robert Dallas, he asks some unsettling questions. He asks, for one, have we Americans ever had an opportunity to express our considered will on our constitutional system? How many of you have had a chance to officially, formally express your considered will? Just, just raise your hands. Oh, come on. Just don't be shy. How many? Oh, come on. Not one? Nobody's asked your, can, okay. Question number two, how many have ever participated in a referendum that asked them whether they wanted to continue to be governed under the existing constitution? Show me your hands, how many? Referendum, how many participated? Z goose egg, again, hmm. 
So Dow says then the answer, of course, is none. Nobody's ever asked us. I mean, we're, but we're not alone in all fairness, not even in ancient